Hi, I'm Andrea Berman from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. We are now going to start with plenary session number two, which is on a global crisis. So I will ask Alan Kruger to come up and join me alongside Konstantinos Megir and Stephen Miller. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much. The assignment that I was given is to give an overview of, youth on, of the youth unemployment crisis, which has already been pretty well covered. So I'll try to go uh, quickly through my overview and then uh, turn to policy. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll see a fair amount of uh, overlap between what I have to say and what others have said. Do you know how this works? Ah, that makes sense. Uh, so uh, first I'm going to show you some slides from the OECD. And uh, the OECD describes the situation for youth unemployment as grim. And uh, that is an understatement. Uh, this shows uh, projections through the end of 2014. The youth unemployment rate for those age 15 or 16 up to age uh, 24 is uh, expected to continue to gradually rise in the euro area. Looks like it's peaked in the OECD at around uh, um, 9%. Uh, the US is uh, the country that shows, uh, I'm sorry, this is overall unemployment, not just youth unemployment. Uh, in the US, the unemployment rate peaked in October of 2009 uh, and has been gradually declining, uh, most recently down to 6.7%. Uh, and it's not too hard to figure out what's been going on. We had this enormous GDP contraction uh, this chart shows you from the Council of Economic Advisors the um, uh, level of GDP relative to the peak. The peak for most countries was the end of 2007. And you can see that uh, basically only the U.S. and Germany have exceeded where they were seven years ago. Uh, Greece, GDP is still about 25% below uh, where it was at the end of 2007. Uh, Ireland looks like uh, it has uh, started, uh, started to grow after bottoming, uh, but it's still down almost 10 percent. Uh, one of the puzzles is Italy's GDP is about 10 percent below where it was uh, at the peak, uh, yet their unemployment situation doesn't look as severe as you might think, given the size of the contraction in Italy. Uh, and you can see uh, Portugal, Spain, France are all uh, well below where they were seven years ago. Uh, this next chart shows the level of unemployment, the unemployment rate uh, for all age groups uh, for some other countries. You can see Greece and Spain at the top. Uh, Portugal, uh, uh, not far behind. Then, uh, then Italy, uh, France, and in Germany, the unemployment rate uh, has been edging down. Uh, this makes a point that others have made. Long-term unemployment is a tremendous problem. Uh, Long-term unemployment has been a long-standing problem in many European countries. It has never been much of a problem in the U.S. It has become a problem in the U.S. Almost 40 percent of the unemployed have been out of work for over six months. Uh, I just wrote a paper for the Brookings Papers, uh, which shows that when the long-term unemployed do get reemployed, they often tend to be reemployed in temporary jobs, part-time jobs, and only about one in ten a year later have settled into a full-time steady career. Uh, increasingly, the long-term unemployed are leaving the labor force in the United States. I think the situation is a little bit different in Europe because long-term unemployment tends to be more of a younger person problem in Europe than in the United States. And I'll, I'll return to that again in a little bit. Uh, this shows youth unemployment uh, from the end of 2007 and last year. The uh, triangles show you uh, the most recent data, the bars show you where the unemployment rate was for youth age 15 or 16 to 24 uh, back uh, in uh, the end of 2007. And you can see uh, the tremendous jump in youth unemployment in Greece and in Spain, um, uh, less so uh, in the U.S. Uh, this chart, which is uh, from the OECD, shows a scatter diagram where on the vertical axis you see the youth unemployment rate on the horizontal axis, you see the adult unemployment rate, those 25 and over. 
Um, and in most countries, the youth unemployment rate is at least double the adult unemployment rate. Uh, this is looking at 2013. Uh, the bottom line coming from the origin uh, shows you what the youth unemployment rate would be if it was the same as the adult unemployment rate. Then the middle line shows you a ratio of two to one. And then the next line, four to one. And you can see that most of the countries fall uh, pretty close to the two to one line. Now, I was curious to see if the situation has changed. And this gets at the question, have youth been uniquely harmed by the downturn or have they just gone with the overall uh, trends in the economy? And uh, overwhelmingly, I would say the evidence suggests that the decline in the economy overall has hurt youth by about the amount you would expect from historical relationships. So this chart shows you looking at 2006, before the crisis, uh, same thing, the youth unemployment rate on the vertical axis and the adult unemployment rate on the horizontal axis. I highlight some countries like Greece. Um, and uh, in 2006, the ratio was 2.6 to 1. Actually, to, to be exact, it was 2.59 uh, to 1. Uh, then I add on this chart what happened in 20, uh, 2012, the most recent data uh, that I was able to get for the full set of countries. Uh, I keep the same line, this 2.59 to 1 ratio. And you can see in red, which are the more recent data, basically all the countries are falling pretty close to the line. Uh, so what this tells us is that the root of the youth unemployment problem is the collapse of these economies. It's the rise in unemployment more generally. We haven't seen a worsening for youth compared to what one would have expected given the overall trends in the economy. Uh, so of course, if we could just solve uh, the overall weakness uh, in the economies in Greece and Spain and Portugal, the youth unemployment rate would likely slide back down this line. Uh, this shows you some regressions to show you that uh, nothing really has significantly changed. I can skip over that. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion uh, about possible skills mismatch. And part of the evidence for skills mismatch comes from the fact that the unemployment rate in most developed countries tends to be considerably higher for those who have less education. So this shows you for all of the OECD, the unemployment rate for those who have primary education or lower secondary education, uh, upper secondary, I put adults on here, that's the solid blue line, and then tertiary education. And this is done for 25 to 34 year olds so that uh, these people have for the most part completed their schooling. Uh, and you can see in the OECD as a whole, the unemployment rate is considerably higher for those who have less education. That's one of the reasons why, in a number of countries, an easy prescription for lowering the unemployment rate is to increase education. Now, of course, we should do it smartly, and, and uh, Robert Lerman, uh, I think, has very good advice about how to target education and provide the kinds of skills that workers need in the modern economy. Uh, but in general, the recommendation that education helps comes from considering evidence like this. Uh, problem is, this doesn't apply to Greece. Greece looks like a developing country. In developing countries, the unemployment rate tends to be higher uh, for those who have a higher level of education. Uh, I have to say I was struck the first time I went to Africa 20 years ago that the unemployment rate was considerably higher for college graduates than it was for people uh, who didn't complete high school. And the reason in Africa for this phenomenon, which I suspect is similar to Greece, is that a great many of the college graduates go and work in the civil service. Given the budget problems in, in, in Greece, uh, given the economic crisis, civil service stopped expanding. And uh, that has had a profound effect on unemployment for higher educated workers. Unemployment rate, according to the OECD figures, increased a little bit more for those with tertiary education than for those with primary uh, or secondary education, although you could see it increase pretty dramatically for all three groups. And this suggests, uh, I think, that uh, the, the situation is quite complicated when it comes to Greece uh, for thinking about uh, how education reform and additional education uh, could help to bring down the unemployment rate. Uh, labor economists always like to caution, you know, the unemployment rate can be misleading. People need to be searching for a job. If they're discouraged, they drop out of the labor force and they're not counted as unemployed, as others have pointed out. So this shows the youth employment to population rate for selected OECD countries. 
Uh, and uh, you can see that the share of youth who are employed in Greece uh, fell through the floor, as it has in Spain uh, and, and Italy a, as well. Also, you'll notice in the US, youth employment has been declining after peaking in the late 1980s. Uh, this shows you the NEAT measure. I, I won't belabor this. This looks at uh, what fraction of youth are not uh, employed uh, and also not enrolled in school or in training. And Greece has had a tremendous increase in the population that's idle, that's neither working nor going to school. Uh, and if you look at the opposite end of the spectrum, Turkey has, an, has had an enormous decline. Uh, let me say a little bit about unemployment for youth around the world. Uh, this chart is taken from a, a very uh, well done study by the International Labor Organization called Employment Trends for Youth, a Generation at Risk. Uh, so this shows the best estimate of the unemployment rate for youth worldwide. And uh, you can see that it declined prior to the crisis, uh, then jumped up, and has started to rise again worldwide. Uh, the unemployment rate worldwide for youth was 12.7% in 2009. Uh, it edged down to 12.3% in 2011. Uh, but given uh, weakness in the world economy, it uh, rose back to 12.6% in 2013. Uh, the ILO is projecting that it's going to continue to edge up. Worldwide, there are 73 million youth uh, who are unemployed. These are people who've made an effort to look for a job. They'd like to work. Uh, even if they're students, they often work uh, when they're not in school. Uh, and that brings home income. They, they learn skills from that. Uh, and that's, that's a cost to those economies. This looks by region, by continent. Uh, and also breaks down the data by gender. There was some discussion about uh, gender differences in Greece earlier. Uh, what's stunning here is if you look at the Middle East and North Africa. Unemployment rates for youth of uh, 40% uh, and considerably higher for women in red, uh, for young women in red, than uh, for young men in blue. Um, returning to uh, problems in uh, the advanced countries, the unemployment rate may even understate the degree of the problem because those are, who are employed, uh, as I'll show you in a little bit more detail, uh, are often underemployed. They're often not utilizing their skills fully. That seems to have been increasing, uh, particularly in Greece, but also in the OECD as a whole. Their employment is often temporary uh, and often part-time when they're looking for full-time work. Uh, this figure shows you long-term unemployment in various countries for youth, uh, looking um, in uh, 2008 and 2011. And uh, the, the red triangles show you 2011. Uh, Long-term unemployment here is people who have been looking for a job for more than six months. Uh, Greece has had a dramatic increase in long-term unemployment among youth. Uh, rose from 5% of unemployed youth looking for a job for over half a year to over 60%. Um, the US has also had a, a rather dramatic increase. Uh, Long-term unemployment is, to a considerable extent, a youth problem in the periphery countries. That's less the case in the US, uh, but it's uh, becoming more the case in the US over time. Uh, the evidence on the scarring effects of youth unemployment uh, are a bit mixed. And the way I interpret the literature is, for the US, the evidence is fairly weak that spells of unemployment for youth have a lasting effect on them. They tend to outgrow it. The evidence for Europe, however, is that the scars are much more permanent. And I suspect that the reason is that unemployment tends to have been longer lasting in youth, in, in Europe, uh, for youth than in the US. In the US, they tended to be short spells, uh, whereas in Europe, uh, Young people were unemployed for a long time. This shows you a different breakdown of um, long-term unemployment. Um, this is for the US. This is from the study I mentioned earlier that I just did for Brookings, where I, I break down the population into three different groups, 16 to 34, 35 to 49, and then 50 and over. Uh, and in blue, I show the share 
of those who were employed in each of those groups. So it's almost a third, a third, a third. It just worked out this way. I didn't kind of set the age groups uh, 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 looking for this, uh, but it's convenient. Roughly a third of workers in the U.S. are age 16 to 34, roughly a third are 35 to 49, and roughly a third are 50 and over. Then in red, I show you the distribution for the short-term unemployed, people who have been unemployed for less than half a year. And you can see that over half of the short-term unemployed are the younger people. Um, and only, uh, I think that's 19%, are people over age 50. If you look at the long-term unemployed, however, uh, youth are underrepresented compared to their representation in the short-term unemployed. About 40% of the long-term unemployed in the U.S. Uh, are in the youngest category. Um, about 31% are 50 and over. So conditional on becoming unemployed, youth are a bit more likely to be short-term unemployed than long-term unemployed, whereas older people are more likely to be longer-term unemployed than short-term unemployed. I, I don't have data for Greece, but I've been looking at Italy. Uh, Italy looks quite different from the U.S. A much smaller share of the employed are in the youngest group, 16 to 30 or 15 to 34 here. Uh, it's only uh, about a quarter of the employed. And then, then you look at the unemployed, over half of the unemployed are the youngest group, and also for the long-term unemployed, about half are in the youngest category. And if you look at the oldest group, uh, they make up only 15% of the long-term unemployed. Uh, this suggests to me that the, the process that's going on in the periphery countries, and if you look at southern Italy, the situation is even more extreme, uh, is different than in the U.S. And in particular, uh, there's much more of an insider-outsider type economy taking place in the periphery, uh, where uh, the older workers are retaining their jobs, and it's much harder for young workers to get a start. And when the old workers, older workers do leave their jobs, uh, they tend to leave the labor force. Uh, they, they tend to retire rather than uh, become unemployed. Now, uh, I think long-term unemployment is particularly concerning because there's a lot of evidence that long-term unemployment uh, tends to have an adverse effect on people that last for quite some time. Uh, mental health and self-esteem tend to decline the longer people are unemployed. There's evidence that physical health and mortality worsen uh, for those who are long-term unemployed. The long-term unemployed tend to be more socially isolated uh, in the U.S., especially if you look at men. The long-term unemployed spend a tremendous amount of time watching television and sleeping much less time interacting with, uh, with friends uh, or others in the world of work. Uh, family formation is affected, which is going to affect uh, population growth in the long run. Uh, earnings look like they're permanently affected by long-term unemployment and job displacement. And then there's a high incidence of subsequent, uh, subsequent layoffs again. And the situation, oh, uh, this shows you the job finding rate for the U.S. And uh, there's a long debate in the economics literature about whether the longer somebody's unemployed, whether that harms their prospects of finding another job, or maybe it's just the lemons who are the long-term unemployed and they just are going to have a hard time uh, regardless. Uh, to me, the evidence suggests that unemployment does have uh, a lasting impact. I say that because studies have found that the longer people are unemployed, the less they look for a job. This, is from a study from Minnesota following the same group of unemployed workers uh, over time. I've done something similar in New Jersey. Uh, and then uh, studies uh, have also sent out resumes where they altered the length of time that people were unemployed. They put different lengths of gaps in people's resumes and sent them out to apply for jobs uh, to look at who got recalled for an interview. And the longer people are, are unemployed, the less likely employers are to want to interview them because they suspect it, 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 it says something about the quality of the workers. And I think these issues are, are probably uh, even greater for young people. And studies have found that young people who enter the labor market when it's particularly weak uh, tend to be harmed in terms of their earnings potential the rest of their careers. Uh, so let me go into a little bit about why, why it is uh, that there's uh, such high youth unemployment. And even in normal times, the unemployment rate tends to be higher for youth. That's exacerbated in a weak economy. 
Well, the first and foremost reason I would highlight is weak aggregate demand. I think that's what comes out of looking at the relationship between uh, young people and, and older people's unemployment rate. Uh, secondly, uh, young people are disproportionately employed by smaller companies. Smaller companies uh, tend to hire workers at the beginning of their career. Also, in the U.S., smaller companies are more likely to hire women and minorities. I don't know how that looks uh, in other countries, although I suspect it's similar. Now, why is that relevant? Well, small companies get hit much harder by a credit crunch. We saw this in the U.S. when I was working at the Treasury Department in 2009, uh, 2010. Uh, small companies are much more dependent on banks for their financing. Banks were severely uh, harmed uh, and cutting back uh, because of the financial crisis. Large companies can access corporate bond markets, equity markets, and those markets came back in the U.S. in part because of the help of the Federal Reserve System. Um, and we devoted a tremendous amount of policy effort within the Obama administration to increase the flow of credit to small businesses, and I'll say more about that uh, later on. Uh, getting away from uh, an economic crisis, job search takes time. Uh, is, the, the labor market doesn't work uh, like um, uh, high-speed trading. Even high-speed trading doesn't work the way we think it works. Uh, we learned from Michael Lewis recently. Um, but it takes time to find matches in the job market. Young people are looking for their first jobs. Uh, those matches do take, uh, do take time. It's an investment by both employers and employees. Uh, on top of that, youth employment is highly seasonal. There's a huge inflow in the summer months when youth are not in school. There's also a huge inflow after graduation. Uh, that means that the job market is flooded with a lot of people looking for jobs uh, at the same time. Uh, and often, they're short-term jobs, so the incentive for investing in the matches is weaker. Uh, skill mismatch is often an issue. Um, in terms of losing work, the most recently hired workers are often the first one released when uh, uh, demand weakens. Uh, I mentioned earlier insider-outsiders. Uh, institutions can block access to jobs uh, for, for young people. Uh, although I have to say, the evidence linking particular institutions like strength of labor unions uh, to unemployment is rather weak and not very robust. Uh, then the other point I would mention, which I think has been relevant for the U.S., uh, we used to have a very large summer jobs program where the federal government would support state and local governments to hire youth in the summer. Um, and uh, that was strengthened as part of the Recovery Act, and it, it has been eliminated subsequently. And as far as public policy goes, I spent four years within the Obama administration arguing to strengthen the youth employment program because it's cheap. You know, if you think about lowering the unemployment rate per dollar that you spend, uh, youth are cheaper. Uh, I was going to say a little bit about, about mismatch. Uh, you can think about two ways of measuring mismatch uh, between uh, workers and jobs. One is we can compare the unemployed and the employed and the skills that they have. And I already mentioned uh, that Greece looks a little bit unusual in that regard and that the unemployed um, uh, by education level uh, don't look uh, uh, all that unusual, uh, all that different uh, than uh, um, or, or put it differently, education doesn't seem to have a, a very big impact on unemployment uh, in Greece. Uh, we could also look at the education level people have for the jobs that they're doing. And we could think about being undereducated or overeducated. Um, going back to Arthur Oaken, uh, we've known that in good times, uh, there are more readily available job ladders where employers are willing to hire somebody who might not have the credentials for the job and help to train them. And in bad times, we see the opposite. And that's exactly what's been happening to the OECD. Uh, this shows levels of overeducation for youth, uh, broken down by gender and also for adults. Um, and undereducation, uh, we could compare uh, do people have the uh, uh, education for a particular job? Do they have more than what seems to be needed or less than what seems to be needed? And since the crisis, we're seeing over-education uh, rise and under-education decline, which means it's harder for people to get uh, opportunities. Um, let me say a little bit about policy. I was part of, um, actually I led the U.S. delegation to the OECD 
uh, last May where the OECD announced its action plan uh, for uh, tackling the youth unemployment crisis. Uh, these are the elements of the OECD recommendations. Uh, provide income support, uh, provided that there's strict obligations for searching for a job, create more effective active labor market policies, try to address demand side barriers. Uh, Greece has already done that uh, to some extent uh, when it comes to the minimum wage, although uh, I'm sure that there's much more uh, that can be done in that area. Provide more work study opportunities. Uh, address structural barriers uh, for the school to work transition. Uh, improve education. Some of these are a little bit like uh, uh, apple pie. Strengthen education. Prepare all youth for the world of work. Uh, strengthen the role and effectiveness of vocational education training. Uh, assist the transition to the world of work. Uh, reshape the labor market to promote policy. Let me say a little bit more about uh, some additional ideas and uh, uh, particularly tailored uh, towards Greece. Um, one of the things I did when I was invited to speak here today since uh, I've only been to Greece once and what I learned was it's incredibly hot in the summer is I reached out to some friends uh, who ha have lived in Greece for a long time and uh, in particular uh, a friend who uh, has for a long time taught at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, uh, who I thought gave me some really trenchant advice, and some of that's reflected in the abstract that I provided for this presentation. Uh, she pointed out that uh, Greece used to have a much more vibrant small business sector, uh, um, producing products like leather, uh, some small uh, agricultural products, food processing, and so on. Uh, that was disadvantaged with access to the EU. Um, a number of youth from her experience are expecting civil service jobs and they uh, viewed that as the reason why they were going on to school. Um, in her view, the Greek education system has not done enough to promote language training, uh, which is going to have an effect on international business and tourism. Um, and uh, she also noted that there's nothing fundamentally wrong about Greek youth when they look for jobs elsewhere, they tend to do fine. When they work in the US or Germany, they tend to do fine. Um, so uh, what types of policies can produce better results uh, in, in Greece? Now, first and foremost, I would say a stronger macroeconomy is going to be necessary. Uh, I think what Jeff Sachs said about improving credit uh, conditions, particularly for small businesses, is very important. <coughs> What we did in the U.S. is we uh, greatly increased the subsidies for SBA loans. These are loan guarantees. In general, guarantees get leveraged, uh, so the budget costs are much lower. Um, so uh, we increased uh, the uh, amount of money that was available for banks to lend to small businesses. We guaranteed 90% of the loans. We reduced the fees that the small businesses were charged. We made it easier for the small businesses to apply. Uh, we also implemented a policy called the Small Business Lending Fund. Um, I like this one because it was my idea. Uh, where uh, Congress earmarked $35 billion, up to $35 billion to use, which we could provide to solvent banks. The regulators had to decide that they were solvent. Um, we would invest capital in the banks. They were charged an interest rate of 5% for the capital. But uh, if they increased their small business lending by 10%, we lowered that interest rate down to 1%. And if they reduced their small business lending, we actually had a penalty. We raised the interest rate. Uh, and that program, which was not big enough, even though Congress earmarked $35 billion, only a few billion dollars uh, went out because the regulators were quite slow in implementing this, uh, has been highly effective uh, from what we can tell. Uh, another piece of advice I would say is, and, and Jeff Sachs said the same thing, think hard about the industries uh, where you could focus attention in Greece, uh, in particular export industries. Tourism is an export industry. Um, agriculture tends to be an export industry. Uh, gear the educational system for those, uh, for those sectors. Um, it is a real challenge, however, especially with the single currency. Uh, to export your way out of a crisis. I remember in 2009, I had a conversation with uh, the vice president of the IMF, and he said to me, 
when I told him that our strategy in the U.S. was to increase exports and the President set a goal of doubling exports in the U.S., he told me that every country in the world expects to export their way out of the crisis. Um, and uh, of, of course, that's not feasible uh, because one country's exports is another country's imports. Uh, but what would normally happen in a situation for a country like Greece is that the currency would devalue uh, and exports would grow. Um, and uh, I think it, it, it certainly makes sense uh, to focus attention on how Greece can uh, expand its exports. Uh, let me say a little bit more uh, about education. Uh, the research suggests that compulsory schooling has a beneficial effect on students. It's rather remarkable. Students who don't want to be there, but when you raise the compulsory schooling age in the UK or in the US, more students stay in school longer and they seem to benefit uh, from, from that. Um, training programs, job search assistance, this was in the OECD recommendations, I just want to underscore it. Job search assistance has been shown to work for virtually every population that it's been uh, uh, provided to and in many countries. Now, uh, job search assistance tends to have a very high benefit cost ratio. Uh, actually, the problem is that the costs are low. Um, so you get a benefit from it, but you have to keep in mind it's not going to be enormous. Uh, career counseling, uh, small business counseling. I, I think Greece needs more entrepreneurs, uh, support for entrepreneurs in general, uh, small business training, uh, relax government, uh, government barriers to starting a business. I mentioned focusing on key industries that employ youth. Uh, then let me end by, by making one point, which was also mentioned earlier. We should figure out a way to use anticipated demographic changes for our, our advantage. And this is the UN's latest projections for population growth by age group. So on the far left is the youngest group uh, then in the middle, uh, middle age uh, people, and on the right, uh, it's, I'm having trouble seeing it, but I think it's 65 and over, 65 and over, uh, different continents. Basically, every country or every region is going to see a large drop in the share of population who are young people and growth in the over 65 population. Uh, that obviously means we're going to need more caretakers for the over 65 population. Um, but we are going to have fewer youth. We're going to have something of a labor shortage economy when it comes to youth. We should anticipate that this is going to happen um, and uh, try to take advantage of these trends uh, because it looks pretty clear that this is going to be happening, uh, happening worldwide. Uh, so why don't, I, why don't I stop there and I think right on schedule. Yes. Thank you, Alan. So now we'll have our first response from uh, Kostas McGear. Thanks. Well, uh, so how does this work? Is the you probably have to push. It no? it's, on. It's, on. Oh, it's on. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Alan, for an uh, excellent uh, presentation. Um, all I really want to do is uh, add some specificity about, uh, about Greece. I guess I have a slight comparative advantage in that. And the first question I want to ask is whether the good times in Greece were uh, really good. And actually, I don't really think they were. They were kind of a big party that started around 1980, uh, fueled by cheap debt, and, uh, and, uh, kind of a st and the private sector was fed by, by the state. So there was no kind of uh, uh, growth in investment. There was no, um, uh, no big technological change. Uh, helping the Greek economy. If you remember or, or, or read about, you know, we, we go back to 1980, uh, Greece, Greek public finances were excellent. Uh, there was a pretty good base of human capital. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio was about 25%. Within 10 years, that had gone up to 100%. And, uh, and, but more importantly, it hadn't gone up to 100% for uh, infrastructure investment or, uh, or other big projects, but it had gone up to uh, to fuel public sector salaries, public sector employment, and, uh, and basically uh, uh, pay, pay contractors that were kind of linked to the, to the state. We end up with a, a massive debt to GDP ratio in the 90s. Uh, you have to go back a bit, because otherwise all this thing doesn't make sense. And we start interpreting what's happening in Greece according to the, 
to the overall uh, uh, credit crunch. But the credit crunch was a trigger to bring back all these problems of Greece uh, to the fore. Uh, we end up with a public sector that pays 30 to 50 percent more uh, uh, for, uh, than the private sector uh, for people with equivalent qualifications. So no wonder everybody wants to work in the public sector. Uh, I, I remember it, there was a time when I was uh, uh, kind of um, working on uh, advising the Ministry of Finance in, in Greece for, uh, 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 for a kind of a small project. And um, at that point, you know, we're thinking about uh, reforms to human capital and so on. And, uh, and uh, Chris Saridis rightly said, who were collaborating at that time, we don't really want to uh, just educate people and having them run around trying to get jobs in the public sector. So, you know, ed education itself is extremely important, as I'll come to. But, uh, but of course, the public sector, the, the behavior of the public sector in Greece had a lot to do with, uh, uh, with what happened. So, uh, basically, uh, you know, Greece, when uh, just before the crisis, had the productivity per hour, because that's what you really have to look at, per, per, per individual productivity in Greece looks like the average EU. But per hour, the productivity in Greece was about 70% of the EU average. Right, that's, that's, that's quite low, right? The, also, other, other things, they had ex we have uh, extremely low female participation. Very, very low proportion of women are working in Greece. And, you, and it's not that difficult. It's not, you know, you not, don't need to be a rocket scientist to, uh, to see why. Basically, Greece, over and above the p messing up its public finances since the 80s, it also introduced or maintained a bunch of, uh, of regulations that uh, you know, were, are extreme in the labor market. First of all, overtime was basically illegal in Greece. You could, it was almost impossible to get workers to work uh, overtime legally. Secondly, there were effective restrictions on part-time work because all costs of hiring were not prorated, but they were based on full-time work. Uh, thirdly, you could not lay off workers, or you still can't, uh, more than 2% of the workforce. Uh, in my small stint in advising the public, uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance, I, met, I mentioned to an official at some point that being able to only fire 2% of the workforce in a, in a month in a major crisis can be a really big problem for, for large companies. And she turned around and told me, we don't have any large companies in Greece. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, then there is a huge amount of restrictions on entry and competition uh, in, in, in a number of sectors. In the, uh, so, uh, anything from services and so on. So, the, basically, the whole system f the fueled an informal economy with massive tax evasion. Effectively, it was, we were subsidizing low-tech low growth kind of small businesses. Small businesses are of course very good, particularly if they are startups that intend to be ambitious in what they're doing. But small businesses that just uh, sell newspapers or, uh, or do plumbing uh, on, the, um, uh, on the side or, or kind of electricians are, are not what's going to generate uh, employment and, and growth. So, so basically when the huge crunch came uh, in terms of massive reduction in government spending, it led to huge decline in domestic demand and mass unemployment, as we know. That's, of course, the, uh, what, what would happen. Salaries declined, and that's often referred to as internal devaluation. But the institutional constraints meant that no export sector or no more dynamic sector was in place to absorb all these new resources. Or, and also, it didn't have much of an incentive to, uh, to, 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 to create jobs. But, but you know, these things have had long-term effects. You know, because uh, you, know, you need setup costs, right? So, on the one hand, you've got huge economic and political uncertainty. We have a, a completely dysfunctional political system in Greece where the opposition and the government talk in completely orthogonal terms. And at the same time, we have huge economic uncertainty and massive, uh, massive uh, constraints. It's no, it's no surprise that uh, businessmen don't want to really uh, invest seriously in Greece yet, I hope. So, uh, <coughs> Now, um, youth, of course, is particularly vulnerable in all this. They're going to be the last people to be employed. They've got low experience. The education system has failed them. The PISA scores are some of the worst in the world, uh, in, the, in the list, probably the worst in the list. Universities have been seriously undermined. So you just have the elite that go abroad and get good education. And those who stay in Greece have uh, degrees that are totally devalued. Um, so, you know, these are, these are serious problems. Of course, a huge tragedy 
because youth unemployment has very long-term effects. You're going to have a whole lost generation here. People will enter the labor market in their 30s with completely permanent effects on the standard of living, on their skills, on their ability to, uh, to, to work. So it's, it's, a, it's a genuine tragedy uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, anything that, uh, that we would have imagined. So what are the policies that could take us out of this? I think, I think uh, there, are, uh, there are a bunch of macro and micro level policies that are uh, that I, I believe, of course, are complementary. So uh, I've grouped them into, uh, into, uh, into three things. Um, the first is about deregulation. The second is about human capital. And the third is about debt reduction. Now, uh, deregulation, I think, you know, uh, many people have been saying this all the time, but we need, to, you know, we need to take it seriously. It's kind of very interesting that the Eurogroup and the EU in the bailouts were really emphasizing uh, uh, fiscal consolidation. They were, of course, right because it was a complete mess. But they also did it because it was easy for them. Right? The Greek politicians don't like to deregulate labor markets. They think that that's going to affect their clients. So they went for the easy stuff, just cut a lot of public expenditure. But that doesn't leave you very far. It leaves you with a very poor economy. So, uh, so we need to liberalize the labor market in a really serious way. Uh, and the only kind of regulations we should insist on, on keeping are things to do with uh, discrimination, gender, race, uh, 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 sexuality, whatever, uh, and health and safety. So these are kind of the bottom line regulations any, civil, any civilized society should have, and we should, of course, keep them. But nothing beyond that. We should let managers just manage. Uh, and at the same time, we, should, we need to put a safety net system there uh, to compensate for the cost of uh, job reallocation. So we need a, a well-functioning UI system, an employment <coughs> insurance system that doesn't exist in Greece, right? Uh, uh, with, which is, of course, time-limited, but sufficiently generous. And we need to, in my view, okay, I know not everybody agrees, we should just abolish all minimum wages and have tax credits. So tax credits are a system that uh, has thrived in the US and in the UK, where basically the government subsidizes low earnings. So these are welfare benefits for the employed. In the US, they subsidize them to a tune of about 40% up to, a, up to a maximum. And I think it's a great system. There's some argument that you need minimum wages to avoid the, uh, the employers taking some of that uh, benefit. Uh, but any evidence I've seen, the incidence really is on the worker. Uh, and finally, we need to deregulate uh, markets for services. You know, a lawyer who wants to move from Athens to of the beautiful island of Zakynthos cannot do that or couldn't do it up to recently without the permission of the lawyers in Zakynthos. And guess what they say? So they can't, they can't go anywhere unless they belong to a large firm. A pharmacy cannot open to compete with another pharmacy unless, the, unless they charge 15% profit margin. And you can go on and on and on. There's not been one lorry driver license issued since 1974. They're only sold to the secondary market. You can keep going. There were regulations that coming out of, of the woodwork everywhere nobody knows of. And they've been discovered now that under pressure we have to deregulate. So labor market and product market and, and uh, service industry deregulation and a well-functioning welfare system uh, to, uh, to support that and avoid the, the vagaries of, uh, of, uh, of the free market and reallocation. Human capital, we need massive improvements in quality of education at all ages. I work on early childhood development a lot. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it, it annoys me that uh, I'm invited to Colombia and, uh, and India to do things like that, but, uh, uh, but in Greece, uh, 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 they, 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 there's absolutely no interest whatsoever. Um, so uh, so, it's, so that, that's massively important. You have to note that if you look at the data, Greece has the, one of the lowest pupil to teacher ratios in the world. Why? Because everybody who finishes the maths department in uh, in the University of Athens, put their name down for a teacher, and then when we come close to election, they're all appointed as teachers, and then they're alloc allocated somewhere in the country. But they are not qualified to be teachers, they are not necessarily interested in that, it's just a public sector job, right? So, uh, so it's not about, about re increasing the number of teachers, it's about kind of uh, thinking of how you, know, how you deliver quality of education, and also incentives in the education system, that's a big thing. Active labor market programs, I think, are really a marginal marginal uh, element in the discussion at this point with these kind of massive problems. In, in any research that I've seen or performed myself, they tend to, uh, you know, they, they, they have very, I mean, very small effect. They have positive cost-benefit ratios, as Alan said, 
because the denominator is so low, they're very cost, very cheap. Uh, on the other hand, job training seems to work best when it's provided by the employer, which of course solves the integration problem that was mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, it's most effective for those who have a better background. And that's where it takes us recursively back to early childhood education. You know, you have to build on success. You can't build on failure. So unfortunately, that takes time. You have to build uh, uh, better early childhood uh, uh, education, better uh, primary, better secondary to be able to reach the people on, on, on whom you can, you can build. And uh, you need to, uh, I mean, introducing adult education, again, I think that's kind of interesting, but I don't think it's going to be the, uh, you know, it's something that any, any good labor market has to have, but it's not at the core, <laughs> it's not at the core of what we should be doing. Finally, the next thing, you know, the elephant in the room, Greece needs 45% of its GDP on current levels, right, without growth, just to service the debt after the original bailout, even at the low bailout interest rates. This was mentioned by Jeff Sachs. This is not sustainable. You're taking 5% of the economy and, uh, and, uh, and taking it abroad every year. This puts huge pressure on government, in, 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 even in fin financing reforms, right? Uh, of course, it puts probably indirect pressure on the, on the banks for credit. This is ridiculous. Uh, any, you know, in, in, in any point in history when there have been massive disasters, there's been uh, debt restructuring. Germany uh, uh, benefits from such debt restructuring when it cut from its much more sinful past than Greece. So, of course, I kind of understand this big moral hazard issue here. You cannot kind of just, okay, goodbye with the debt. But you can leverage, if you're a sensible policymaker sitting in, uh, in Bonn or, or in Brussels or somewhere else, uh, you can see that you can use this debt to leverage reforms. So you can sit down with the Greek government and set out a, a set of, uh, of reforms. Of course, that requires some debate, what needs to prioritize. And then with each uh, reform that's being uh, implemented, you somehow restructure, forgive, uh, reschedule, but in a substantive way, an amount of debt to reach some kind of sustainable level of 50, 60%. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, th this has two effects, right? Not only does it alleviate the problem of the public finances uh, and, 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 and allows a bit more liquidity in the Greek economy, it also uh, reinforces those Greek voices that want reform rather than the ones who are kind of um, anchored in the past and uh, have this kind of peculiar uh, model in, um, in mind uh, that we've been uh, implementing all, all these years and whose judgment is clouded by the fake good times of the pre-crisis uh, of the, the pre-crisis period. So the positive outlook that such a debt uh, forgiveness program would have that was, uh, would actually reinforce, not only would uh, give the direct incentive to carry out the reforms, but will also change the political balance in Greece and of course reduce the, the political dangers that, uh, that we very clearly have uh, in front of us despite the, the political lull that we've had since the, the current government has, uh, has come to, to power. So this is what I had to say. Thanks. Thanks, Kosas. Uh, we'll now hear our second response from Stephen Miller. Thank you. I should begin by saying I'm not uh, far from an expert on Greece and not particularly qualified to talk about that. I've worked uh, on the issue of youth unemployment globally, though, for many years within the ILO, within the International Labor Organization, and that's a little bit what my, my experience, uh, where my experience comes from. Uh, the, I would like to maybe put up one slide which I gave back there. It's not going to be a PowerPoint presentation, don't worry, but it's simply to, uh, in fact, it repeats some of the, some of the figures, I think, that uh, in a different way that Professor Kruger just gave, trying to put the youth uh, employment uh, in a global context. I don't know if that's readable in the back, uh, in the back row there. But, I mean, one issue, too, I think we have to identify how much, uh, where the real problem is in terms of youth unemployment. And where this is leading to, in, in the few remarks I'd like to make, amongst the many, I mean, Professor Kruger just gave a very comprehensive list of 
both the basic policy options from uh, aggregate demand to a number of very specific areas. And I think we need to look at whether these different policy options should be uh, across the board, universal uh, measures that deal with the labor market as a whole, or whether they should be specifically targeted at young people. And I think to do this, it's important to put youth employment in the larger context. I mean, one issue we see in the first column is that the youth demographic bulge as it stands today, the, the discussion focusing on Greece and on Europe, but this is not Greece, this is not even Europe, but it's the ILO classifications of region, which includes developed economies and the EU. Uh, the youth demographic bulge is the lowest of all regions in the world at 15%. You find the highest demographic bulge, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, 36% of the total population is between uh, 15 and 24 years old. So I think it's important to look globally at where, where are the young people. Uh, and I think there have been some interesting discussion on that. I think. Uh, Professor Kruger's last slide talked about looking at demographic shifts in the world. And uh, the, there, there's this sort of facile uh, uh, tendency to minimize, to say that, you know, where are we going to find jobs for all these? Uh, the, the fact that we have many young people is a problem. But I think a lot of times the problem is going to be we're not, gonna, not going to have enough young people in, in certain regions of the world. And what's interesting, the unemployment rates we've talked about, uh, we know that the highest unemployment rates are in uh, Middle East and North Africa. What's very interesting is the question of why we have such low unemployment rates in, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, the answer is quite simple. I mean, not that 12% is low, but it is uh, amongst the lowest, except for East Asia and South Asia on that thing. The reason we have such low youth unemployment rates is unemployment I hate to put it this way, but it's a luxury that uh, young people cannot afford. So most young people are working, but they're certainly not earning a decent income. They're, they're young to show up in unemployment statistics uh, because they're working in the informal economy. They're uh, they comprise a large group of the working poor. And this may have some lessons for Greece, as Professor Kruger, when he talked about links between education and employment, pointed out. Um, another interesting thing to look at is a little bit the link between the first and third column is looking at the percentage of youth in total unemployment in the world, uh, I mean in, in per region. So uh, it's really the discrepancy between these two figures that would determine whether or not we should focus, I would say, on targeted policies or more universal, target, target, uh, more universal policies. For example, again, if you look in Sub-Saharan Africa, you find that the, uh, or you look at rather other countries, South Asia, where you have half of the youth who are, uh, half of the total numbers of unemployed are young people. But you have uh, only 28% of young people uh, in that age group. In, uh, you have 20% of young people who make up, 28% uh, of the population who make up the demographic bulge. So in countries where there's a huge discrepancy, where if you're having uh, all of the young people, uh, half of the young people being unemployed and half of the young people making up the, uh, the overall working age economically active population, then I think this would argue for more universal policies rather than targeted. Now, I'd like to say uh, just a few words about, uh, I think Professor Kruger again in his abstract talked about youth being the canary in the cold mine. And uh, I don't know how far we can stretch this metaphor, but the, uh, you know, if we look at the, the uh, what can we do to, uh, to target the canary and what can we do to target the coal mine, I think this is, uh, uh, leads to an interesting discussion. We've talked a lot about education and training, and I think we've heard that this is indeed the best educated and trained workforce ever. So policies which overly focus on education and training somehow shift the blame of unemployment from the private sector, from the government, to the young people themselves. 
And, and uh, I think there's a very important element we haven't really talked about that much, which concerns youth aspirations in the labor market. I think there's a feeling that basically the labor market is out there. That's the reality we have to deal with. And uh, we don't really adapt our discussion to what young people really want. And a lot of times I was in Egypt, for example, where there was a, a program to try to uh, sell the German dual track system, a long-standing program that was called the Mubarak Coal Initiative. It was just about uh, six months before the Arab Spring, before everything fell apart in, in Egypt. And the whole idea was to make uh, to introduce the system, which works very well in Germany, which works very well maybe in other parts of the world, a, a very laudable idea of giving young people uh, workplace experience, of making employers part of the, the, uh, the issue. But the problem was in, in Egypt, uh, it was basically done hand in hand with the push to liberalization of the Egyptian economy, which uh, President Mubarak started uh, many years earlier, and this uh, push to liberalization, again, for export orientation, was try to retrain, uh, the, what the employers wanted, basically, was to people work in export-oriented industries, such as garment, such as ready-made shirt-making <coughs> industries, and so on. And uh, as much as you can say, well, this is where the jobs are, you young people, you have to get real, this is where it is, you have to deal with it, it was totally out of sync with the aspirations of young people. And the problem will not be solved unless we get the aspirations of young people on, on board. Entrepreneurship, we've talked about. Uh, entrepreneurship, too, uh, forgive me, but I think a lot of times it's like we're telling young people since we, meaning we, meaning the governments, meaning the private sector, are not able to give you a job, create your own job, <laughs> do it yourself. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough call. And there's been a study, a number of studies on entrepreneurship, but one study in Latin America that covers about 20 different countries, it found that, first of all, of all the young people uh, who were working, 13% were entrepreneurs. But of that 13%, only 1% uh, were entrepreneurs by vocation. They really wanted to be entrepreneurs that were hiring other people. 12 out of the 13%, 12% were entrepreneurs by necessity. So what does entrepreneur in that sense mean? It means self-employment in the informal economy. It's leading nowhere. Young people don't want to do it. It's out of sync with their aspirations and so on. So, I think entrepreneurship, too, is a, a valid area to investigate, just like uh, education and training is. But the resources that are thrown at entrepreneurship programs and self-employment programs, particularly in developing countries, I've seen these huge youth funds start in Senegal and other places, it really is throwing money at a problem. And the amount of funds allocated to it are totally out of sync with what the benefits we can expect from entrepreneurship uh, development programs. So, so much for the, uh, there's workplace experience, there's special targeted programs. I would say targeted programs to um, all these special youth employment initiatives. Uh, I would say a lot of times it's a type of willing suspension of disbelief on the part of policymakers who are trying to you know, uh, since they really don't know what to do, so they'll create a special program. And uh, but the, it's like a black box that nobody really knows uh, what it produces and what it can be uh, uh, held accountable for. So, what can be done about the coal mine? And I mean, I'm I, I think uh, I'm certainly don't have a lot new to add to a lot of the discussions. Uh, Aggregate demand issue has always been raised. Uh, I think it was the key point that Professor Kruger made. But how do you raise aggregate demand? And that's where the crunch is. That's where the, a lot of the discussion goes. And I hope we'll have a discussion of that. One area that I've looked a lot at, and in collaboration sometimes with other people in this room, uh, is if you hold, um, you try, various options, 
there's always going to be uh, what is left over in terms of youth unemployment. So you look at entrepreneurship development, how many jobs are going to be creating from that. You look at education and training, how many, uh, how successful is that going to lead into people into sustainable jobs. And then you look at the shortfall and is, uh, and, and governments really, I think, not just in emergency situations like in Greece, as Professor uh, Sachs talked about, we're in an emergency situation, but also in normal times, developing counter-cyclical employment of last resort programs, where the government actually steps in and creates work opportunities for, uh, for people. And even though this sometimes can be viewed as anti-private sector, it can be viewed as unaffordable, I think the, the issues are that you need to look at what, what is the cost of unemployment versus the cost. There were studies even done in the US a number of years ago that said between one or two and two percent of GDP, you could create some form of employer of a last resort program in the United States. And uh, there, I won't go into more of that because of time, but I think it's, it's very important to, uh, to look at the uh, ways that we can analyze and evaluate different options in terms of the resources we put at them and in terms of the re result we can expect. One, you look at the stimulus programs, you look at even in the United States, the uh, American uh, uh, recovery and reinvestment program. You look at the different stimulus programs which are now quickly falling out of mode in Europe. But I think there's a lot of work to be done to evaluate the employment impacts of these programs. I've been pushing for employment impact assessment for public investment programs generally and, and public service programs as well. And I think this is one area that Greece and that many countries could be looking at. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Now we have um, maybe about 10 minutes for questions. So um, please state your affinity and for whom you have a question. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm James Wright. Uh, I want to thank Professor Kruger for pointing out that classes is at the American School of Classical Studies don't just read Pinder, they actually think about the economy. I'm the director of the American School in Athens. Um, and, and, and we're very, we're very, we've been there for 133 years, which is simply to say that, that people who study the classics and study humanities are deeply invested um, in, the, in the cultural, in the intellectual, and especially in the economic life of Greece. And it's been fascinating listening to the conversation this morning. Um, I'm, I, I do have a question. It's, it's the question that comes up um, has to do with the fact that we're here to talk about recharging youth and the problem of youth unemployment, but the, the elephant in the room that keeps raising its, its, its tusk, its, its trunk, seems to be the bureaucratic and the cultural and political issues that prevent even dealing with any problem. But I was fascinated uh, that Professor Megier pointed out that it, it was after the 80s that it seems that Greece went off the rails. And one of the things that I've noticed, because we, we have, even though we're an American institution, we get European Union grants. And the bureaucratic hurdles that we have to jump over that are imposed on us, both by the European Union on the one hand, uh, but also by the Greek government, in a sense, emulating, I think, European Union. It seems like there's a kind of codependent relationship in the number of regulations uh, between the two. And I just wonder, it, to what extent is the issue uh, of joining the EU part and parcel of the problems, or, or and, and if so, were they exacerbating existing problems within the cultural, political, uh, regulatory framework in Greece, or is this something that really uh, came about because of joining the EU and then, and then, of course, making the transition to using the euro. I just, that hasn't come up before and I'm, I'm interested because I've been working in Greece for 40 years and, and it seems to me that if you point to the early 80s and then you point to the introduction of the euro, you see particular blips in the change in way, uh, in, in, in the forms of economic behavior of individuals and institutions in Greece. 
Do you want to collect a few questions at once um, and then get responses? No, or? why don't you, uh, since we don't have a lot of time, why don't you um, answer that while we gather some other questions? Um, I, I think it's a very good question. I guess I would tend to think of what happened in the 80s and the 90s as water under the bridge, and you've got to kind of deal with the situation that you have. The, um, the, the, the uh, European Monetary Union, I think, helped Greece to live beyond its means. I think, as Costas said, there was a debt bubble uh, which enabled Greece to raise funds uh, below rates that were sustained, you know, which, which a, a well-functioning market would have generated. That money was not used to improve competitiveness. Instead, as Costa said, there was a big party. Um, but that's kind of the wreckage that, that Greece has to deal with at this point, going back and saying, why did it happen? Because those conditions no longer exist to recreate that party. Um, the uh, euro as a currency, in my view, and I think most of the economics research has found there's relatively little benefit from having a common currency. It's more a political issue. And uh, that's a deep political issue. Uh, I have to say I've been struck by the Eurozone country's attachment to the Euro. Um, it's really quite striking, although it, it, it must be a reflection of the fact that I don't understand European history well enough uh, to understand the, the uh, continued incredibly strong support where, you know, I mean, I remember sitting the U.S. Treasury in 2010, uh, thinking that this was not going to be a stable union. Uh, and I think that the odds of it being uh, unstable are much, much lower now. Um, anyhow, I think that I would think very much on the demand side. And, you know, early childhood is great. Twenty years from now, you'll have some workers who could go into these apprenticeships and, and the training for the companies uh, if there are still people in Greece you know, if they haven't all out-migrated. Um, so I think that the fundamental macroeconomic question is how do you generate enough demand? One of the reasons why I emphasized entrepreneurship, most entrepreneurs fail. So from an individual perspective, it's extremely risky. Uh, and the biggest predictor of success is if someone's parent was an entrepreneur. Um, but I, I think that the country needs uh, more of an external focus because it's not going to be possible to generate enough internal demand. Um, and the credit crunch, I think, I, I mean, it is a puzzle given a 20, 25 percent drop in labor costs, hardly any change in exports, very little change in price. Now, one possibility is that companies don't compete, so um, they just book that all as profit, the fact that their costs were lower. Uh, ordinarily what you would expect is that the lower cost would be reflected in lower prices, that would raise demand. And uh, Jeff Sachs gave quite an interesting possible explanation, which is supply contracted at the same time because of the credit crunch. In some sense, that's an easier solution because uh, credit crises can be, uh, can be addressed. We, 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 we sort of know how to do that. It's, it's costly uh, if it's done well the government can actually end up making money, as the U.S. government did with TARP. Um, but those, those are the areas I would be thinking about in terms of policy for the next two, three years. Uh, I, I think uh, e each European country has its own motivation for being attached to the, to the euro. Uh, we uh, who watched uh, Greece coming to the euro really thought, and uh, it turned out, turned out to be we were wrong, that it would discipline Greek politicians who, uh, who used all the monetary and fiscal instruments at will. We had interest rates of 30 percent before, uh, before, uh, before the kind of process to joining the euro and so on. That was the, that was the hope. Um, uh, there is, of course, an issue that, you know, what would we do now if we were rethinking of the euro? That's a, a rather different question as to what we do now, given that we are in the euro. I think the transition costs out of the euro are potentially huge, so we really need to think very carefully what the next step is. I think we should really be reinforcing the institutions that, uh, that support the, the eurozone, like uh, 
you know, um, uh, banking regulation, you know, basically uh, unified banking regulation and so on. Uh, so I, w I won't go into that much, but you know, I think I think we have to, uh, as Alan said, we have to uh, see where we are now and what's the best step given where we are now, rather than thinking as to whether we should or should not have either joined or been part of this creation of the euro. Um, policies, you know, basically Greece needs a reconstruction. So, uh, and, and reconstruction requires a package of policies, some of which, of which are going to work immediately, right? Uh, such as debt restructuring, but that's not the policy. That's, uh, of course, a negotiation. But you know, you need this kind of uh, macro macro stuff that will uh, will improve uh, standards of living basically immediately. Some that are going to work in the uh, short to medium term, like labor market and product market and service market deregulation, and some that will eventually, you know, will take some time. But this time will come, you know, uh, us in our 50s know how fast time passes. So, uh, so uh, the, the fact that, uh, uh, that some, some policies are going to have, to, you know, would take a long, long view uh, should not stop us from having them. On the other hand, they should not displace the kind of policies that will have the, the immediate uh, effects on the structure of the economy. The only way that Greece is going to come out of the situation here now is to, uh, pro uh, you know, it really has to, promote exports and has to promote high value exports. There is quite a lot of good human capital in Greece already. There are a lot of people abroad that m are willing to come back, right? You need to create the entrepreneurial conditions for them to be able to, to actually uh, work in Greece. Uh, and then uh, th there's a huge, m huge role for Greece, right? Because it's not, only, uh, it's not only in Europe, it's a bridge to the Middle East, right? So a cultural bridge as well as a, a, as a geographic bridge. And to the to the southeastern Europe, which is a huge uh, market for Greece, uh, for well, also for export, but also for you know for for investment and, 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 and collaboration. So you know, I think we should see the the policies as a as a group, as we really need to reinvent this country. Uh, and you know, w w there, there are and and in that respect, we need to solve many many problems. But of course, some are of, of much more immediate uh, importance. Um, I think someone has the mic right there. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My name is Thanasis Tsaftaris, and I'm the Minister of Agriculture and Food for the Greek government. So, uh, we will speak about agriculture tomorrow, of course, but allow me today to tackle a couple of things that are related mostly to unemployment of the young and the university graduate. I think we should uh, go our thinking two steps below and make a, a more detailed analysis for understanding what's going on of, of the unemployment of these people and, uh, and the, the opportunities that we could offer. Okay, speaking about university graduates, we should see the kind of graduates, the graduates that we have. Let's say approximately one fourth of graduates are engineers. And all these years, you know, a large percentage of them were civil engineers and to a lesser extent were the architects, and then to a smaller numbers of uh, uh, mechanical engineering, and, you know, uh, information technologies, uh, chemical engineering, among, uh, among others. So, now, what, what's going on with this graduate now? Those who suffer are the civil, civil engineers, due to collapsing of the construction industry. Some of them are finding a job now in the big, you know, roads, construction, highways, etc. This is a small percentage. The rest of them are living for Middle East and Africa due to the fact that Greek companies operated in there. So they, we are losing them in, in large percentages. Secondly, architects. Architects, I have an experience because my, my wife is an architect and my daughter is also an architect. My wife is retired. My daughter is a graduate of Columbia and Pratt here from New York. They found a job in reconstructing and renovating buildings. You know, with this uh, uh, rotating of building uses now, a lot of companies closed, uh, uh, closing down. You know, offices, etc. They found jobs in there in doing this kind of work. The problem is now left only with uh, mechanical engineering. Some of them immigrate, some of them mostly in, in Germany, I should say, and then to the lesser, ex to the lesser extent, the chemical engineering. Now, let's go to the second large group of graduates, that is MD, medical doctors. They are suffering, but they are easy to find jobs. You know, some of them migrate uh, due to the fact that they speak uh, English and German. Some of them speak very good English. They immigrate in the United 
United Kingdom, okay, and to, to, a, lesser, to a lesser extent in, in, in Germany. Now, how about the third big group? The third group is the, uh, the teachers, you know, which is almost 25 to 30% of our graduate. Then we can also go to this uh, uh, lower level of analysis. Uh, we have, let's say, uh, literature, you know, teachers. We have uh, the teachers for mathematics, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, etc. Those who suffer most is the literature due to the fact that we have, due to uh, decreases in birth, date, birth rates, you know, the number of students are decreasing constantly for the last few years. Okay. Now, here we have a problem. Here we have a problem, and I hope that people who will speak tomorrow of the, the cultural ministry also will help us on this matter to see how they could find a job, you know, in museums, in archaeology, uh, etc. Now, how about the rest, the, the mathematicians, the physicists, the chemists? It was rather unfortunate that we trained all these people to get ready to become and work as teachers only. They should be retrained to go into, in, in, into different uh, production sectors. For instance, we hire now a number of biologists in environmental projects and also in fisheries, aquaculture in Greece. They could be easily retrained to go into agriculture and food, et cetera, et cetera, chemists. Now, the, we left with the, the third, uh, uh, the, the, the fourth thing that I wanted to say. I hope I didn't miss any big sector of our graduate. That is lawyers, but lawyers already discussed them in the goals. So I don't want to, to go into lawyers. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have to end shortly. I don't know if any of the panelists want to make some last minute comments to, to his points. Just, just one quick remark. You know, I, just looking from afar, it looks like the lowest hanging fruit is in tourism and in agriculture. And if you say uh, we have this crisis because we educated too many architects and civil engineers and we're not building, which is what the U.S. went through also after the housing bubble burst. Uh, but certainly archaeologists and classicists can work in the tourism industry. And one issue is raising the status of the industry. Um, and. Uh, I think another issue which Costas emphasized is occupational regulation, uh, the barriers that prevent uh, people from competing in those industries. And also, one also has to market to other countries, which, which requires some investment. Um, but to me, just looking from abroad, that looks like the easiest set of solutions to start on. Um, and, and I guess I'm not very surprised to hear about the challenges that the architects and, and, and the engineers face, because we faced exactly that same issue in the U.S. after the housing bubble burst. Thank you. So now we'll be adjoining to lunch, where we can continue all these conversations. I think Stelios has one last thing to Just say. Just to say quickly that we are videotaping the proceedings of the whole conference, and they will be available to our <laughs> website as soon as possible. So you don't have to worry that you will miss something. <laughs> Everything will be there. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you.